Not because of who she is, but because of who he is. So I thank God for our teachers. I thank God for those uh, men and women who help out. I know there's a number of people that help out with our kids. What a blessing. It, it's a huge deal. And I want to, I never thank you. And I really want to, uh, I really want to um, thank you, um, teachers, and maybe those who are. To the left. I'm about to, uh, oh, is that one empty? Yeah. Okay, I'll steal that one. Thank you. I'm sorry, Brother Frank, I just dropped your glasses, but I won't step on them. <laughs> Dollar store glasses, that's great. Whatever works, right? So this morning we want to get right into it. We're talking about, we've been talking about thankfulness, and this is Thankfulness Month, and you know, the whole thing, and, and guys, it's not about pumpkin pie. I mean it is, but it's about more than that. It's about more than that, right? It's about, uh, you, you, can, I, can I be honest with you? Are you going to like me any less if I tell you I don't even like turkey? But it's all those side dishes and all those trimmings. And I mean, I like roasted Brussels sprouts too. But we got into this habit some time ago. We got into this habit that when my mother, when we get together, there's a lot of us. And so we got into the habit of doing two things at Thanksgiving. We do a turkey, of course, because you kind of have to do it. And it would be like, I guess irreverent or sacrilegious in some way if we didn't have a turkey on Thanksgiving, although I told my mom, do like a Cornish game hen some year, just put it in the corner, there it is, we got our bases covered. But we have to do the turkey, so there it is. But the other thing that we got, my parents have this rotisserie oven. Remember that infomercial with the Ronco's rotisserie oven? I gotta tell you, that thing works. I'm not selling them, I don't make any commission or anything, I'm just saying the thing works. And so we got into the habit of every year we would get like a, a pork roast, right? And, we, and I would marinate it days ahead of time and I'd stick it on this thing and we'd get there early and we that thing is cooking, and it's like, it's monumentally good. It's like you're, you're just saliva dripping. So after a couple of years of doing that, we thought, why don't we up the steaks? So that's exactly what we did. Instead of buying it myself, I said to the family, look, why don't we all chip in and do prime roast in there, prime rib in there, which we started doing. There's a, little, there's a lot of us, so it comes out relatively cheap when you got like 15 people chipping in, which is nice, right? And so we started to do that, and at the end of the day, at the end of the day, the food is fabulous, and I really, we, I love Thanksgiving, and the smells, and the warmth, and, and, but what's it really all about? If I ask you what's Thanksgiving about, what should it be about? It should be about the what? The people. It's about the family. Now, we say that, but I wonder sometimes if we really mean that. If we meant that, if we meant that, then our day might look different on Thanksgiving, wouldn't it? Mm. Now, some of you are worried. Some of you are thinking, is he about to ask me to? Is he about to ask me to give up my Thanksgiving? No. Is he about to tell me not to eat dessert? No. That's not, that's not where this is going. I just want you to keep something in mind. If it's about the people, then it ought to look that way. Mm. If it's about the people, then it ought to look that way. Keep the pie, keep the turkey. We're keeping the prime rib for sure. But invite someone. Do you know someone? Is there a neighbor? Is there somebody that maybe you've invited to church that hasn't come? Is there somebody that you know is by themselves, or maybe it's just a, a one or two people, and maybe they used to come, but now they don't? Can I ask you, if you're able to, and I know that there's family dynamics and all kinds of complications in there, but can I ask you, can you talk it over with your wife or your you know, spouse, your family, whatever, can you think through who would you invite if you could to Thanksgiving dinner? Now, I know that we ask you to invite them to church, but I'll be honest with you, sometimes it's easier to invite somebody to church than to dinner at your house. So I want to encourage you to let that be the case this year. Just tuck it away. Just tuck it away. All right. So today I want to read with you 1 Kings chapter 11, verses 1 to 13, and we'll start from there and move on. We've been talking about 10,000 reasons to be grateful and thankful, and obviously there's, there's far more than that. But let me read this this morning, 1 Kings chapter 11 verses 1 to 13 and most of you already know that we're talking about Solomon so here we go verse 1 of chapter 11 King Solomon however loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter Moabites Ammonites Edomites Sidonians and Hittites they were, they were from nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites you must not intermarry with them because they will surely turn your hearts after their gods nevertheless Solomon held fast to them in love. Now, for a genius, Solomon's an idiot. Read this next sentence with me. He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines. I can't handle the one I have. 
I'm a little stressed trying to keep her happy and safe and healthy and provided for and all that. I don't know what he was thinking or not thinking, but it just makes me think, okay, all right, Solomon, he, he, why, why is this man in the world? But in some ways, dumb as a rock. But let's move on. Verse 4. And it does say, concubine, and his wives did what? They led him astray. Verse 4. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods. And his heart, and you know what that means? Remember that comment. As Solomon grew old, as he got accustomed, his wives turned his heart towards other gods. It means, but at one point, his heart was with God. Moving on from there, moving on from there. Solomon grew old, uh, turned his heart towards other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God, as the heart of David his father had been. And he followed Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Moloch, the detestable god of the Ammonites. Guys, these, this is not for the faint of heart. We're talking about idols and statues that they would light on fire and put babies on. It was a big deal. This is a demonic thing that became okay. How did that become okay to somebody that was serving the God of his father, David? How did it become that? Moving on. Verse 7. On a hill east of Jerusalem, Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the detestable God of Moab, and for Moloch, the detestable God of the Ammonites. He did the same for all his foreign wives who burned incense and offered sacrifices to their gods. The Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. Although he had forbidden, now remember, God did not appear to David. He sent prophets to David. But to Solomon he appeared twice. Wow, that should have had a more profound effect, but here we are. Verse 11, so the Lord said to Solomon, since this is your attitude and you've not kept my covenant and my decrees, which I commanded you, I will most certainly tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your subordinates. Listen to this, very important. Nevertheless, for the sake of David, your father, I will not do it during your lifetime. I will tear it out of the hand of your son. Verse 13, yet I will not tear the whole kingdom from him, but I'll give him one tribe for the sake of David, my servant, and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. Now, today's message is not just for parents. It's not. It's for family. But if you are a parent, or one day you will be, right, Jimmy? One day you are actually going to have offspring, I pray. Whether that's a good or bad thing, I don't know. But there will be little Jimmys running around, right? <laughs> Warm fuzzies. Can, all right. So, so just bear with me here that today's message is for those with children, is for those with family, but it's also for those without. It's also for those who are going to have children. It's also for those who have nieces and nephews and, and cousins and brothers and sisters and just family in general. If you're going to appreciate, right, we've been talking about being thankful, and if you're going to appreciate what God has given you, then you're going to do, then you're going to do the right things by them. Remember last week we talked about being thankful, being thankful for what? The most important things. And so we were on family. We were talking about family. And today we're going to continue in that same vein, right? Remember that little song, Straighten Up and Fly Right, that old song? Who sang that? Uh, not Frank Sinatra. Who sang that song? Does anybody remember that song, Straighten Up and Fly Right? It's a good song. Okay, never mind. The whole illustration's shot. I'll just move on. All right, how about this one? Remember the Volkswagen commercial where the guy is in the parking lot and there's a, a shopping cart rolling towards his car? And he's like running over pedestrians and like crashes into the cart to wipe it out so that it doesn't hit the car. You protect what's valuable to you, right? To me, to me, a car is not worth that. But you, people protect what's valuable to them. I saw online, there is a safe, you know, a safe, like with a combination of steel safe or whatever, $15,000. I'm thinking to myself, if I had a $15,000 safe in my house, that would be the thing I needed to protect because it'd be worth the most. I don't have anything that's worth putting in a $15,000 safe. But what people value, they protect. And rightly so, and rightly so. And if you value something, you're gonna hold it very highly. What are you thankful for this morning? I know we talk about this a lot. And let's, let's, maybe, let's maybe be some thankful, let's maybe be thankful for some things that are less common. Can we for a moment? Number one, toilet paper. Can I get an amen? amen? If anybody's ever been on a missions trip and it's to a place where they don't have toilet paper, you're like, dear Lord, I've arrived among savages. It's tough. It's tough. I remember in Sicily, we, had, we used to go to this place in Campania, which means 
it's like it's out in the middle of nowhere. It's basically just a little farm, or everybody had a little farm, little cabin somewhere on a hill with a with with grapes or figs or whatever. And at the campagna, they called it the margana. At the, at the margana, there was this little house, but the house didn't have running water for many years. So if you had to use the bathroom, it was like take a walk in that direction or that direction or that direction. Make sure that you're far enough away from all the people, and make sure that you take enough grape leaves with you. So believe it or not, toilet paper. Secondly, toothpaste, hallelujah. Three, thankful, pizza. Four, opposable thumbs. How would you hold the toilet paper, right? <laughs> Ability to sleep, amen, amen, right? I should hear from Ron, a, a, a huge amen on that. A place to sleep, right? Water, your, your ability to see. Trash collectors. I know a couple times when trash collectors go on strike, it's not a good time for anybody, especially me, right? Number 10, batteries, right? Number 11, soap. We ought to invest in batteries. If you're a parent, you just invest in batteries. Thankful for batteries. 11, soap. In fact, let's talk about soap for a second. If you guys are doing these Operation Christmas Child boxes, and I hope that you are, and you intend to send soap, let me give you a quick little two cent tidbit here. These are my, just my two cents. If you're gonna put soap in here, put ivory in here. Do you know why? Somebody tell me. It floats. Ivory floats. And so, thankful, thankful for soap. So these boxes are going to end up in some countries where they have um, rivers or wherever it is they're going to be washing up. And if you lose the soap, that's it. Goodbye, soap. Unless it's ivory, then it floats. Isn't that interesting? I just found that out recently. Anyway, so thank you, Jesus, for soap. Thank you, Jesus, for, thank you, Jesus, for deodorant, right? Thank you, Jesus, for those, those things that are good. Everybody, you know what? Can everybody just say it, say it with me? Thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus. for soap that floats. For soap that floats. Thank you, Jesus, Thank you, Jesus. that the person sitting next to me the has, soap. has soap. Wait, why didn't you say it? I'm just kidding. Never mind. It'll come to you later. I'm kidding. We're grateful. Thousand you smell lovely. I'm just, you know. Thousand reasons to be thankful. Ten thousand reasons to be thankful. We ought to be a grateful people. We ought to be a happy people. We ought to be a people overwhelmed with joy. And let me tell you something else. Church ought to be a happy place. Is it time? Is there a time for, for being serious and solemn? Yes, it is. But church ought to be a place where you can laugh and understand that God is a God of joy and God is a God of laughter and God is a God of sense of humor. And if you don't have one, start praying because that's where I'm. That's enough off my soapbox. But it's the truth. The truth is sometimes we want to get so serious with God. And there are times when we need to get serious with God. But I'll tell you something, when we're out there, when we're with our coworkers, or when we're at school, or when we're going through our day, they ought to see happiness on your face. We should not look like our dog died. We're Christians, we're happy. Amen, okay. I found this a while back, and it's a list of what a father did, wrote this list for protecting his daughter. Now, I don't have a daughter, but I thought this was a hilarious list, so I wrote it down. Rule one, some of it may be a little, a little risque here, so forgive me, just bear with me. If you pull into my driveway and honk, you'd better be delivering the package because you're sure not picking something up. Okay. Rule number two, right? Amens from all the dads who have daughters. Rule number two, if you can't keep your eyes or hands off my child's body, I will remove them. A right? little brutal, gruesome. Rule three, I'm aware that it is considered fashionable for boys of a young age to wear their trousers, trousers loosely. I want to be fair and open-minded about this, so I propose a compromise. You may come to the door that way. However, I will... I will affix your clothing to your waist with my electric nail gun. For safety's sake. That's fair, I think. That's fair. Rule four, it's usually understood that in order for us to get to know each other, we should talk about sports, politics, etc. Don't do this. All I need from you is an indication of when my daughter's going to be safe at home. And all I want to hear from you is the word early in regards to that. Rule five, I have no doubt you're popular with many opportunities to date other girls. If you make her cry, I will make you cry. I'm sure you've heard that before. Rule six, the following places are not appropriate for a date with my daughter. Places where there are beds, sofas, or anything softer than a wooden stool. Places where there are no parents, policemen, or nuns with eyesight. Places where there is darkness, places where there is dancing, holding hands, or any kind of happiness at all is not acceptable to take me <laughs> Hockey games are okay to attend. Old folks' homes are better. Rule seven, do not lie to me. I may be, appear to be a pot-bellied, balding, I don't know who wrote this. A pot-bellied, balding, middle-aged, dim-witted has-been, but on the issues relating to my daughter, I am the all-knowing, merciless God of your universe. 
Uh, interesting. <laughs> Rule number eight, be very afraid. It takes very little for me to mistake the sound of your car in the driveway for a chopper coming in over a rice paddy near Hanoi. When my Agent Orange starts acting up, the voices in my head frequently tell me to clean the guns as I wait for you to bring my daughter home. As soon as you pull into the driveway, you should exit your car with your hands in plain sight, speak the perimeter password, announce in a clear voice that you brought my daughter home safely and early, and then return to your car. There's no need for you to come inside or onto the porch. The camouflaged face at the window is mine. I don't even know what my point is. I just like the list. It was just so I shared the list. The truth is, the truth is, every per, every parent has a desire to protect your kids. It's it's in there. It's it's in there. And today, that's what we want to talk about. And I'll and I'll share where that comes in later at the end of this. But it's important, right? You have you you have no greater possession. At least that's the way I feel, right? It's, I know that's the way my wife and I feel, and most of you do too. Has, uh, do as well. There's nothing greater than, than family. There's nothing more important than protecting that, that child. I shared a little bit last year, how uh, last week rather, how it's tough to love. You know, it's tough to love a, a big, loud, noisy relative that you can't get along with or whatever. But when you have a baby, that thing can spit up on you and you're gonna be like, oh, sweet, precious little. I mean, you know, within reason here. I mean, when they stink, they stink with like, it looks like they've got like the gift of smell bad, right? But at the same time, these babies are just endearing to you. There's nothing you can do. They just endear themselves to you, and you love them that way. It's instinctive. And it ought to be instinctive that you love your family, you love your kids. And we'll get back to that, right? We'll get back to that. You'll do everything in your power to make sure that your kids are usually what? Well-fed, well-educated, good night's sleep. You make sure they wear their seatbelt, see the doctor, the dentist, etc. But today's scripture is talking about one of the most important protections that we can offer to a loved one. And it's important, and you'll see it by the time we get to the end. In fact, if you only followed one simple rule, it would accomplish more for your children and your family than anything else you might try and attempt to do. You might do the education thing, and you might invest money for them, and, and all those are good things. But the truth is, at the end of the day, there's one main thing that you can do for your family and for your kids that will protect them and bless them. We'll get to that. In a very, very sad tale about what Solomon did here. Um, in this tale, there's the key on how we do that, how we protect our kids, how we protect that thing that's so valuable to us, right? And so my first point is a look at Solomon. My first point is a look at Solomon. And, and uh, let's just take a look at that. And the Bible tells us that Solomon was blessed. He was blessed by God. God allowed Solomon to do things he didn't let David do. Because David had been enmeshed in all those wars, remember? And God told him that you're been, you've been a bloody man. You've been a man of violence. So God allowed Solomon to do things David wasn't, right? He was allowed to establish Israel's border, made it the largest, most peaceful nation ever. Um, you know, he accumulated wealth beyond any other king in history. We know that. God, Solomon was the, the richest king in history, right? 1 Kings 10.14 tells us he received tribute of 25 tons of gold every year from the nations around him. And in addition to that, um, there was all kinds of things. I mentioned before, God spoke to him directly. He didn't speak through a prophet. Solomon was a blessed man. All, all that was, all that had happened to Solomon should have told him how grateful, how thankful he should have been. And I imagine that for a while he was. In fact, we know that Solomon asked for the right things from God, didn't he? When he, when he, when God offered him what he wanted, what did he ask for? Wisdom. Wisdom. For what? To help me rule your people, right? God, Solomon was a good man. Amen. He started with the right reasoning. He started with godliness in there, and then somewhere it all went wrong, right? God permits Solomon to build the temple in Jerusalem, something David deeply wanted to do. David wanted to do that. There was, it, you know, it must have really hurt David to think, I'm not going to be allowed to do this because of the way that I've lived my life. And yet, and yet, David still, what? Had a heart after God. And he didn't leave from that. But he lived in a state of repentance. David came to a place in his life, I believe this firmly, where he walked in a state of humility, in a state of repentance, in a state of understanding the fact that I've done what I've done and God still loves me is all that I need. He got there. He got to that point. Amen. Of course, Solomon was one of the wisest men who ever lived. We're told that he wrote Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, right? First Kings chapter 4, verse 32 to 34 says that he spoke, Solomon spoke, 3,000 proverbs, and his songs numbered 1,005. He described plant life from the cedars of Lebanon to the hyssop that grew out of the walls. He taught about animals, birds, reptiles, fish. He wasn't just smart. He was a genius. He would think about, think it through for a second. He was the wisest man that ever lived. 
So Kissinger or Oppenheimer or Einstein or fill in the blanks. You can think about the smartest people that you know, strategists and, and scientists and, and researchers and all of that, and, and they're still not as intelligent as Solomon was. He was a sharp guy, right? Men of all nations came to listen to him and, and, and hear what he would have to say. So the question comes to mind, if he was such a genius, how could he have gone so far off? What happened, right? How could a man so blessed by God end up turning his back on God? Why would this guy who enjoyed such a close relationship with the Lord saw the, saw the, the blessing of it turn to Ashtoreth and the goddess of the Sidonians and Moloch the detestable? As in 1 Kings 11.5 that I read a little bit ago. He built a high place for Chemosh, the detestable god of Moab, and for Moloch, the detestable god of the Ammonites, etc., etc. He burned incense. He didn't just build them. He burned incense. He got involved. He allowed himself to get sucked in to their type of living. Hello? Think about your life right now. Is there any place in your life where you would think, yeah, I probably got sucked into what they do. What I watch on TV, yeah, here we go again, always going to be legalistic. I'm just, I'm just throwing it out there. What I watch on TV, what I listen to for music, where I go to eat, where I hang out with, who my friends are. Have you, has your life become desensitized to things, people, places that God would say, I don't want you there. You don't fit there. You're not supposed to fit there. Oh, I know we're supposed to be evangelistic. I get it. I get that you're supposed to have influence and we're supposed to have relationships with people that, that don't know the Lord and all of that. But here's the thing, folks. God told us that we were going to be different. So they should look. So we should look different. You're supposed to be salt and light. Well, when you're sleeping and somebody flicks on the lights, right, as I wished it would have happened two hours earlier in my house this morning, but it didn't. When you turn on those lights, you can barely see straight. Everything looks like a blurry mole, you know. Light's supposed to be shattering. Salt is supposed to be, you know, one of the, one of the best things about Brazilian Portuguese. You didn't think this, this sermon would go by without food talk, did you? <laughs> one of the best things about churrascaria or rodijo, the barbecue, the Brazilian barbecue, is their salt. That's what they do. They, they marinate the meat and they salt it and they salt it and they salt it. And it's not just any salt. It's a special blend. I have a bag and I could share it with you, but then I'd have to kill you. <laughs> I, I, I love Brazilian meat, but it is salty. It's real salty. But that's what makes it good. Salt is supposed to be what? It's supposed to be shocking to you. It's supposed to shake your taste buds, right? Well, it, it, the other thing that salt is used for is to be abrasive. I mean, we're compared to that. We're compared to being abrasive, spicy, blinding people. Are you? Would you describe yourself that way? Let me say that again. Would you describe yourself within your family, within your workplace, as an abrasive, spicy, blinding individual? Or do we all just try to blend in? That's human nature. I'm not, I'm not blaming here. I'm not blaming here. I'm not condemning. We're all in the same boat. But it's human nature to try to, to, try to not stick out. Right? But God says you're supposed to be light and salt. Some, somebody's talking about salt back there somewhere. So listen, I want to encourage you to think through what we're doing. Solomon was in this situation where he himself was the one burning the incense, not just building the places. Moving on, moving on. His heart had turned away from God. So we took a look at Solomon, right? Simple question, where's your heart? Solomon's turned away from God. Where's your heart? Secondly here, a look at what caused Solomon to turn away. We know that he turned away. We know that he had these wives and this and that. But what caused him to turn away? First of all, he had developed a kind of arrogance. This godly, influential, and influenced individual got to a place where pride and arrogance sunk in and made him think incorrectly, right? Look again at verse 1 and 2. King Solomon, whoever loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter, Moabites, Ammonites, etc. They were from nations the Lord had said to the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them because they will surely turn your heart after their gods. But Solomon held fast to them in love. What made him think that God was wrong and he was right? What made him think that he could, he could stand firm and he wasn't going to be... Look, if God commanded his people not to marry women from the nations... Solomon botched it up in a big way, and it was the beginning of his mind, right? But who was going to stop him? Who was going to stop him? 
he, he probably thought he was too strong, too, too founded in his faith, and he was arrogant enough to believe that God must be talking to somebody else. He can't possibly be talking about me. Now, those of you who have sons or daughters, you go through this sometimes. Mom, I met a great guy. Mom, I met a great girl. Does she love the Lord? Is she a Christian? Well, she goes to this church. She might, you know, she might be. Listen, missionary dating does not work. What's missionary dating, you might ask? Some of you already know. The idea that you can date someone and you're going to lead them to the Lord. Now, I need a volunteer that I'm not going to hurt. I need a, a, a volunteer that I'm not going to hurt. Nobody's here that I, I feel like all of you are just too fragile near me. I need somebody, somebody. <laughs> I don't know who to use. Honey, can you help me out? No, that won't work. That won't work. Who can I use? I just need, I just need one person very quickly that I can abuse slightly. James, thank you, buddy. I see that hand. You're an abusable, you're an, you're an abusable sort of guy. Now, here's what I need you to do. I need you to stand right here. Right here. Yeah, right here. Okay? All right, I need you to take my hand with that hand right there and, and help and, and, and pull me up. Oh, come on now. Come on now. Oh, what are you doing? It's hard. You're bigger than me. You're supposed to pull. <laughs> no, now I want you to see something. I'm not bigger than you. You're saying I'm rounder than you. No. Listen. Listen. It is. <laughs> okay, come on, Dad. That's it. You're done. Listen. Can I tell you something? You know, he probably knew what was coming. Can I tell you something? It's easier to pull somebody down than to pull somebody up. He's in great shape. He works hard. He's probably all chiseled. I'm not. I'm fluffy. And I, I work very hard to become like this. But I can still pull him down. Why? Because it's easier to pull somebody down than to pull somebody up. Will somebody hear me today? Whoever your friends are, whoever it is you think you can date, I'm just going to look at you because you're the only teenager in sight. Listen. It's easier to pull somebody down than to pull somebody up. Why do we think that we can enmesh in the wrong club, in the wrong group of men or women, and think, well, I'm going to be an influence to them, and think that they're not going to be an influence to me? Now, be careful. God may call you to date someone or, or, or be part of an organization or be part of something. He may call you to do that. That's okay. That's okay. That's, those are good things, right? God wants you to be influential. God wants you to be vested in your communities and, your, and, and, to, be, and to shine. He wants you to do that. But can we not forget, can we not forget that we need to never lose sight of abrasive, spicy, blinding. That's what we are for the name of Christ. That's who we are. And as soon as any other priority sneaks in front of that, we have lost sight of the term Christian. Are you with me? Do you hear me? Amen. I know it's not for the faint of heart. As soon as anything you do during your day takes on a bigger priority than what God has called you to do, you're in trouble. Now, please, don't go to work and go to your boss and lay hands and begin praying for them in tongues, right? You still have to be normal. You still have to be in the world, right? You still have to function well, right? You don't want to do anything that's going to get you fired or what have you. At the same time, remember this. Remember this. The missionary dating scenario that I was talking about before. A young lady comes home and says, uh, you know, oh, he's such a nice guy. He's such a nice guy. Listen, when you're, when you're going into a relationship, and this isn't just for young folks. You're going into a relationship with somebody that might not know the Lord the way that you do. It only takes a minute for their best foot forward to go back to normal. You understand what I'm saying? In that initial relationship, when you meet somebody, they may seem great, but they don't love the Lord like you do. But they're so nice. You don't know. They're just so, she, he's so kind. She's so kind and so active in, in things. And it only takes a little while for their best foot forward to cease. And then who they really are, their true colors, what matters to them, will come out. And then it's too late. And now, guess what? Before, before you know it, you're unequally yoked. And now you're in trouble. Because now you realize, wow, you know, we really didn't think the same at all. Now these important issues that just had never come up, now they're up. Now we're talking about things, and I'm thinking to myself, how in the world did I get involved with her? I didn't know she thought this way about that. How in the world did I get involved with him? I never thought he would be this way. Solomon apparently had the same type of thinking. And what it is, it's arrogance. It's arrogance. God, that's not going to happen to me. That's not going to happen to me. Yes, it is. Right? Which leads into the second thing. Secondly, the reasons that Solomon was pulled away, his heart was turned. 
The second thing, Solomon spent his time with the wrong people. Let me stay there for a minute. Don't hang out with these people. They'll ruin your faith. They'll undermine your love for God. They will. If you spend enough time with people that don't love the Lord, they will rub off on you. Now, if you go and you spend time by, by design now, you're prayed up and you're ready and you say, you know what? I meet with this guy. I meet with this girl or I do this. I do this thing that we do together. We go, I don't know, whatever, hunting, fishing, right? Around these parts anyway, right? The women talk about like I'm cream puffs and doilies and the men are all talking about like shooting stuff and eating it, which I'm good with, by the way. But I'm saying you, you plan these things and you do these things and do do that. I mean, do, do relationship, do plan. Plan to meet with people that don't know the Lord, but do so by design. Do so by design. You'll hear my, one of my favorite words is doing things on purpose. Being a Christian with intentionality. So if I'm going to get involved in some sort of organization, or if I'm going to be dating someone, right? First of all, that's a whole different matter because I'm going to be making sure that, that that person that I'm spending time with loves the Lord. And here's the thing. Before I ever get to that point, before I ever get to that point of dating, if I spend time with someone, I'm going to get to know who they are. I'm going to get to know who they are. But with intentionality, we spend the time with the people that we spend the time with. Amen? And you know what? Just so you know, it's not just evil people that make us stray from God. Did you know that? Did you know? And I'm about, and now, you know, please don't take offense to this. But the truth is, did you know that there are people in church that you ought to not hang around with? What? That's right. That's right. Folks, there are people in church, and I, and I love you all, and I love this church, and I love the church at large. I love the people of God. But the truth is, if you're hanging around a gossiper, get away from them. If you're hanging around somebody that's negative and pessimistic or a gossip or any of those things, those things are evil. And you can sugarcoat it. You can candy coat it any way that you want to. But you need to, che you need to check your heart and say, God, I don't want to be influenced like this. And so the time might come where you say, you know what, <laughs> Andrea, you, I'm just not going to. No, I'm just kidding. Right. <laughs> the time may come, really. I, I mean this. Be wise. Be wise. And here's the other part of that. Here's the other part of that. If you suddenly find yourself abandoned, then maybe you need to say, God, am I saying the right things? Or has pride crept in? Am I the pessimist? You know, we're, we're, we were all thinking about somebody else. Tell the truth. Shame the devil. You know you were. You weren't thinking about you. But we also go to God and we say, God, am, am, am I the gossip? Am I the negative one? Am I the one that wants it all my way? Am I the one dealing with pride? Okay, moving on. Now, blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. That's what the word of God says. Who wrote that? Solomon's dad. Guess he missed it. I guess he missed it. I guess Solomon missed it. His dad wrote, blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. And whatever he does, what happens to it? It prospers. Ooh, that's... Sometimes we try to do something, and it kind of dies on the vine. And we think, why can't this thing that I'm doing, why doesn't it flourish? Why isn't everybody flocking to my group? Why don't they like me? We're nice people! We do feel that way sometimes. And God is saying, there's stuff to fix. There's stuff to fix. There's stuff to fix. And before you become an influencer in a good way, there's stuff to fix. And before you do that, you got to make sure that you're not spending time with people that are what? Mockers and evil and scoffers and, and ignorant of what it really means to be genuine in the Lord. And this is, this, these are both people that know the Lord and people that don't. That's the truth. Every Christian needs to come to a place of introspection where they say, is everything that I'm doing right? Or do I need to say, God, check my heart. Check my heart. Make sure that I'm not the one dealing with whatever it is. Rage or, right, those buried, suppressed things. Moving on. And that was Psalms chapter 1, verse 1 to 3. If you want to have a full blessing of God in your life, don't walk around with wicked people. It's just that simple. That's what the word says. I'll say it again. If you, if you want the blessing of God in your life, don't walk around with wicked people. Don't stand around with people who enjoy, rejoice, and rejoice in sinning. Don't sit down with people who would mock your God and faith. You say, well, most people aren't going to actually come right out and mock God. If they're gossiping, they're mocking God. 
If they're negative, if they're saying things that ought not be said, then they're ridiculing your faith because you already know what to say and what not to say. You already know this. You already know to say, God, don't let my thoughts dwell there. Forgive me. I, I, I shouldn't be going down this path. Help me to be an encourager. Help me to be a builder-upper. I know that's not a word, so what? Builder-upper. It is now. Amen. Thank you. Use that later. Thank you. What happens? What happens when you hang out with the people that you hang out with? You begin to pick up their habits. I'm Italian. I love adobo. Do you know why? Because for years we spent time around these Puerto Ricans, and I love them dearly. Where's Antonio? There he is. <laughs> yeah, I, for years I spent all, most of Carney was poor. So like their food and the things that they got accustomed to, and I work with Colombians. I love their food. I can cook better Spanish food than most Spanish people can. And so can, so can Andrea. Andrea, wait with the people. Look, Andrea's a marshmallow. She glows in the dark. But I'll tell you something. Her Spanish rice is better than anyone's I've ever had. It's good. Why? Because when you spend time with people, they influence you. You start picking up what they do. The thing you've shared about this with me, with the guys that you work with, some of them. You listen, when you share when you share your time with people, they start to rub off on you, right? They become they become part of you, whether you want them to or not. They become part of you. Sometimes, how many know this? Acknowledge this when you go to school or if you're at work. The people that you work with, they become sometimes more of your family than your family does, because you spend so much time together with them, whether you want to or not. Right? So how much more important is it that you spend time with the right people when it's not when it's by choice? Because sometimes you don't have a choice. You gotta be where you gotta be, right? But there are times where you have a choice, and how much more important is it then to say, let me make sure that the influencers in my life are influencing me in the right direction, which is something Solomon obviously let go. And most importantly, here's what happens when you spend time with people that don't have a heart that's right for God, your perspective on God changes. Do you remember what I shared a couple weeks ago? Our perspective of God needs to be right. Why? Because if my perspective of God is wrong, if my understanding of who God is is incorrect, then my understanding of me is wrong. If I don't really understand who God is, if I don't have a right perspective on the Lord and on Jesus Christ in my life, guiding, directing, if I don't get that fully, then I don't fully understand who I am. And things go out of whack. Things go out of balance. I begin to think that this decision that I've made is good and it's an important one and it's a priority and this is what I'm going to do. But my perspective is wrong. So all my decisions will be wrong as well. And when you spend time with influencers like that that don't love the Lord, they're rubbing off on you. And all of a sudden you're making decisions that you should never have made. I spent a lot of time dealing with people that were in addiction programs or people that were incarcerated or what have you. Can I tell you something? This is phenomenal. It's, it's a strange, strange, it's, it's a phenomenal thing to me. Shocking. I would talk to somebody, and they would share with me what they were going through while they were locked up, and they would share with me, what, and I would be encouraging them, you know, you really, you just have to throw yourself on God's mercy, you have to be in the word, you know, when, you're, when your parole officer comes around, you do what they tell you to do, listen to your attorneys, you know, be, you know, be, be a, change your heart, God can, move, God can move you, God can make you soft hearted, you know what would happen? They would listen to another inmate that would give them different advice. And, oh, yeah but, yeah, but you don't know this lawyer because this guy, this buddy over here of mine just told me what this judge is like. And Really? So you're going to take the advice of the other guy that's locked up. Don't we do that? Well, we do do that when we take the advice and the opinion of somebody that's not walking with the Lord. So now I claim to be walking with the Lord, and I say that I'm a Christian, and I'm trying to do things the right way, but I'm about to get counsel from somebody who doesn't know the Lord. How dumb does that make me? Pretty dumb. Yep. Pretty dumb. I'm just calling it real, right? This is the way it is. One of the most peculiar things I've ever seen. Same thing with addic addiction programs. Hey, man, you need to stick it out. Young man, young lady, whatever. You need to stick it out. They love you. That's why, that's why the rules are so strict. I know it's hard, but you're going to make it. And then they hear from other people in the program. Oh, yeah, they're too strict around here. This, you can find something better than this. And they listen. And they get out. And they fall into the same pit, influenced, influenced. Now, I know that those are kind of big, big examples and sort of flashy illustrations of what we're talking about, but that happens on a smaller scale. 
happened on the Spelter scale. Just a, a quick, funny little side note here. I, I had, uh, I had, you know, two cars. We've never had a car payment in years and years and years. We've never had a car payment because we always thought, well, before the car dies altogether, we'll trade it in, get something else that we can afford. So we never had a car payment. I had a conversation with somebody once, and they were like, um, you know, I can't wait to get this new car. And I was sort of like, well, you have a car. It's, it's not, a, it's a nice car. Why would you get a new car? A couple months later, I'm sitting in the car. I said, so are you looking for a new car? He's like, no, I got a car. Why would I get a new car? I'm like. I said that, but that was a good thing, right? It was an influence thing, but it's okay. It's a good thing, right? But who you spend time with, that's who's going to influence you. So we've looked at him. We looked at why his heart went in the wrong direction. We get to my third point here, what God told Solomon, what God told Solomon. And I'll, and I'll zip through this. So God told Solomon, because you've turned your back on me, I will most certainly tear the kingdom away, give it to one of your subordinates, 1 Kings 11:11. 11, 11. The kingdom was supposed to go to Solomon's son, Rehoboam, but it, and, and it did, part of it did anyway, that was his, it was his right, Rehoboam's son, uh, Solomon's son, Rehoboam was supposed to get it, and he got part of it by succession, but because of the sin of the arrogance, uh, of his arrogance, Solomon robbed his son of a great inheritance, because Solomon cho chose to turn his back, now on Wednesday I talked about this, on Wednesday I talked about this, how you can, you can be blessed for generations to come. And you can be cursed for a couple generations, and the and the cursings and the genera uh, the cursings are less than blessings. But let me let me read this first. It says this. Nevertheless, God said, God said, even though this is what I wanted to do, here's what I'm going to do. Nevertheless, God says this. How how grateful am I for grace? And God looks at me and says, Nevertheless, you deserve this. Nevertheless, right? He said that. I will tear it out of the hand of your son, yet I will not tear the whole kingdom from him, but will give him one tribe for the sake of David and for the sake of Jerusalem. Are you seeing where your accountability comes in now? Are you seeing what you're supposed to do to protect your family, to love them? If you're going to say, I love my family and I'm grateful for them, and you're going to act in that way, are you seeing now where your accountability rests? You see what God did? You see what God did even for Rehoboam when Solomon lived like a moron? But because of David, God's grace is still there. That's a huge blessing. I hope you're picking that up. That's not New Testament, folks. That's Old Testament. We like to say the Old Testament maybe doesn't, doesn't talk to us as much as the New Testament, the grace. Oh, yes, it does. But you have to read it. You have to see it. The grace of God on Rehoboam, just because of David, his father, a grandfather, actually, at this point, right? Solomon sinned, deliberately disobeyed God, turned his back on God. But God withheld his punishment during Solomon's lifetime. And then Solomon's son, Rehoboam, who'd lose over half the kingdom, still didn't lose everything. But because of David. Huge. There's an umbrella effect of faith. There's an umbrella effect of faith. You need to hear this in Exodus chapter 20. God gives these command commandments, right? Warnings and promises. You shall not bow down to them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children of the sin. Listen. Punishing the children for the sin of their father to how many? The third and fourth generations of those who hate me. But showing love, how many? To a thousand generations of those that love me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Aren't you grateful for, for, for grace today? Aren't you grateful for mercy today? Amen. Thank Jesus. Most often, people only focus, focus on that curse thing, right? On that third commandment. God will punish the children for the sin of the fathers. To the third and the fourth generation. Now, before you get discouraged, uh, discouraged, understand if you're sitting there thinking, "Oh gosh, well there I go," because my dad was not a good, you know, my dad was not a good man. But that curse can be short-circuited. Why? Because God is gracious and He loves you. So even the person living under the curse can get out of that thing and rest in Christ. Aren't you thankful for that? It is, guys. It is more than pumpkin pie. We ought to make Thanksgiving a religious. It, it should be a spiritual time as well when we get together. Nothing wrong with that. You ought to, we ought to be thinking. We ought to be talking and walking and digesting that gratitude and that thankfulness all year long because of how good God has been to us. Men and, men and women who've lived lives that, that angered God can change the course of, of their own history and not just their own. But what were we talking about at the beginning? Their children. People that have not done everything just right. You may have grown kids here today. You may have grown kids here today, and God is still saying, if you change, if you change your heart, honor me, be faithful, I'm still going to bless your kids. That's huge. What a sense of peace and of confidence it gives me to be able to say, you know what? It, this, it speaks to every parent who has a loved one, a child, a niece, a nephew, a, a brother, a sister that doesn't know the Lord. It speaks to every one of those people and says, you know, I'm going to be faithful to God for no other reason than when I want, than I want to be able to pray, God bless my family. Amen. And God will. He won't change somebody against their will. 
He won't change their mind against their will. But God has a really good way of letting the Holy Spirit chip away. And he has a really good way of bringing the right people to talk to that son or that daughter that you're worried about, that you're praying about. Just be faithful. Just be faithful. You'll change that curse. Amen. Let me wrap it up. Let me wrap it up. Psalm 103, real quick. From everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness with their children's what? Children. With their children's children. The way I live, the way I honor God and try to work to be faithful, not in my own righteousness, but through Jesus, the, be the better job I do, the more I apply myself to the word of God and to scripture and to prayer and to honoring God in all of my words, in all of my actions, you walk in humility and in repentance. I'm not just blessing my kids, I'm blessing their kids. I'm blessing my grandparents and they're not even born yet. Do we get the value of that? I've shared before, I love formulas. I love formulas because they work, unless it's Common Core, as I've said before, right? A plus B equals C. If I'm faithful, it blesses my kids, it blesses their kids. It does. Amen. In other words, when we fear God, keep his commandments, etc., <laughs> we're creating this umbrella. David had a personal relationship with God, loved God, feared God, and he wasn't perfect, just in, in case you're wondering. He wasn't perfect, just like none of us are perfect, perfect. But God used David to describe this scenario. He set David up to illustrate this principle that he was blessing Rehoboam, keeping him from that punishment because of David. And David was a man who blew it. You know that. We know David blew it royally, right? Psalm 51.1. This is what David writes afterward. This is what David writes afterward publicly. People saw what he wrote. They knew he was the king. Listen to this. Have mercy on me. Oh God, according to your unfailing love. Just apply this to your own heart this morning. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Create in me a pure heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Restore to me the what? The joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. And then later, then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will turn back to you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Even, even though Sullivan made some really disastrous things, even though Solomon really blew it at the end. You know, it doesn't say Solomon repented. You know that? Samson, Solomon, some of these guys that they have good stories in the beginning, they sort of crash and burn. They go down in flames. But because of David, this is still a success story. Because of God's grace and mercy, this is still a success story. It's still a victory. Isn't that your heart this morning? Isn't that your heart to say, God, help me to do things as best I can so that I can protect my family? We're talking about protecting. We're talking about value. We're talking about the reasons that we value things and how important our family is to us. God, help my heart to be right so that I can bless my kids and bless my wife, bless my husband. Help me. Help me to do the right thing so that I can be a covering to them, an umbrella to them. Husband that doesn't know the Lord. Wife, what does the word of God say? Serve God. Just by your life, you're witnessing to him. Same thing the other direction. Husband doesn't, I mean, a wife that doesn't know the Lord. Husband, serve God faithfully. Win her over by your love. Not by convincing them, but just by the umbrella of faith that you've got in there. Amen. 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 Don't you want that? Don't you want to, I want, one day I want to sit in, uh, by the throne room of, uh, in heaven with all of my family. Everybody that makes it there. I, I look forward to worshiping. I look forward to worshiping together. Don't you want that? Don't you want that? This morning I end here. I close here. We'll wrap up. And I just want to share one last thought with you, and we'll, we'll wrap it up. I want, to end, I want to end here in keeping with the idea of being joyful. So we, you know, I, I just, I really want to encourage you today. Don't, don't let these words that you hear come in one ear and go out the other without having it affect your heart. Last week I asked you, last week I asked you, did you know anyone that you needed to call? Remember, did you know anyone that you should maybe patch things up with, that you ought to connect with and say, you know, uh, for whatever reason, God is, God is linking us together, putting us together. And I pray that you did that. And this week, this week I want to encourage you to take a little introspective look at yourself. Take some time this week and look at your heart and say to yourself, the things that I'm doing. See, these are things that, uh, that usually people that are in trouble, people that are in trouble, whether it's addictions or, or criminal behavior or anything like that. Usually when somebody's in trouble, you know what they fail to realize? How it affects the people around them. What it does to the people that they love. So let that not be said of a Christian, huh? 
Let that not be said of me. So this week, just take that time this week and say, am I doing in my actions and in my words and in my prayer life and in my Christian walk, does it look right? Am I honoring God? Am I pleasing God to the extent that I can say, God, not because of my righteousness, but I'm trying. I'm walking the right way. So bless and cover my family. Work at that this week, can we? Pray about that this week. Think in that direction this week. Can we do that? So we know that we want loved ones in heaven with us, and I, and I believe that you do too. Thank God for that. And so I close with this little story in keeping with having our loved ones up with us in heaven. Now, if you've heard it before, just pretend that you haven't. A Minnesota couple decided to vacation in Florida during the winter. They planned to stay at the very same hotel where they'd spent their honeymoon 20 years earlier. And because of hectic schedules, it was difficult to coordinate travel, so the husband left at one time, flew to Florida on Thursday. His wife would fly down the following day. The husband checked into the hotel, and there was a computer in the room, so he decided to send an email out to his wife. Does anybody sound like, look like they know this? No, good. So he decided to send an email to his wife, and however, he left out one important letter in the email, so it didn't go to the intended recipient. It went to someone else. He never realized his error. Meanwhile, somewhere in Houston, a widow had just returned home from her husband's funeral. He was a minister of many years who was called home to glory following a sudden thing, and the widow decided she was going to check her email, expecting to see messages from relatives and friends. After reading the first message, she fainted dead away. The widow's son rushed into the room and found his mother on the floor and saw the computer screen, which read, To my loving wife, I've arrived. I know you're surprised to hear from me. They have computers here now. And you're allowed to send emails to your loved ones. I just arrived and have been checked in, and I see that everything's been prepared for your arrival tomorrow. I'm looking forward to seeing you then. Hope your journey's not as uneventful as mine was. Oh, P.S. Sure is hot down here. Can we stand? Father God, we thank you and love you that you are so good to us and so gracious and so kind. Father, we pray today that you would plant in our heart a desire to see our loved ones with us in heaven one day. God, I ask that you would give us the discipline and the integrity to walk right, to just straighten up whatever it is we need to with you and to walk right. Father, we pray that you would allow us to live in such a way that it would cover our, our families, oh God. We pray that umbrella blessing over our family as we work to be faithful to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Be blessed. We'll see you Wednesday. Uh, very quickly, on Wednesday night prior to Thanksgiving, there will be a night of thanks here at the church. I know some of you may be with family. That's fine. Actually, Andrea and I will be with family ourselves. But for those of you who are local and want to get together, Wednesday before Thanksgiving, night of, night of testimony here at the church. God bless you as you go. Thank <laughs> you.